So, good afternoon everyone. I hope you had a nice lunch. I will not introduce myself because I only have 15 minutes and my name is not as val valuable as what I actually want to tell you. So let's just jump, jump right in. Because you're not here to learn about me. You're, learn, uh, you're here to learn more about different technologies. And all these different technologies actually go into your toolbox. The toolbox is really a representation of all the tools you know, all the frameworks you've learned so far. And Having a wide toolbox is really good because the more tools you have, the better that you are capable to solving a problem. But having a lot of tools is really only one aspect of the toolbox. The second is actually being able to master certain parts of your toolbox. Because if you have a lot of tools but you only master the hammer, you will still uh, try to treat a lot of the problems as hammer problems. And it's not always hammer time, unfortunately. So. Uh, the way that I normally approach it is I go to conferences, I learn a lot, but to both expand my toolbox by learning new things and to master different things in my toolbox, I do a lot of pet projects. And uh, when I talk to my colleagues about this, they say, yeah, I went to a conference, but I have no idea what to do. I have no inspiration on uh, what kind of pet projects that I can make. So today I will be sharing three ways that I inspire myself to do pet projects. I have a lot of content, it will go fast, but all my slides, code and documentation is online if you actually want to dive deeper in how I did these pet projects. So the first uh, thing that I try to do is try to limit myself. This sounds very contradictory to what I just said, learning more, expanding, uh, uh, showing a lot of different frameworks and trying them out. But limiting yourself is actually really good for you because we have a brain. And normally, when a brain sees a problem, it will go back into history and it will apply exactly the same solution to a similar problem. So, uh, taking this back to uh, how this works in our real life, if I see a microservice that needs to be built, I can almost hear Josh Long whisper in my ear, use Spring Boot. And that's not good, because if we always go for the same solution, for the same problem, then we don't actually learn anything. So I try to limit myself. And the way uh, I try to apply this is uh, actually uh, a, a small video game. It's called a Flappy Bird, so I try to recreate it. And uh, one of the principles that I tried to use to limit myself was uh, I would not use Maven, because I heard Venkat say, Maven, uh, you don't use Maven, Maven uses you. So I try to apply this and not to use any libraries. But then you have to actually uh, do two things. You first have to find a way to render the graphics in Android. And as a second part, you actually need to implement some physics. Because physics are quite crucial, because without gravity, this game makes no sense. And the way that I uh, approach this is, like many people, I started Googling. And the first problem, the, um, the engine part, there's actually a really great uh, blog series on Kilobolt where uh, this guy explains everything in detail. It goes from the normal interfaces in Java, and then in the next chapter, he shows how to implement those interfaces in Android. So for me, this was perfect. I had my gaming engine, but now the more difficult part, I still had to build uh, the physics myself because I didn't want to use an engine. And actually for that, I will jump to this wonderful book. Uh, has anyone heard of the nature of code before? Only one person I see. So the nature of code is a really great book. It's all online with code examples. And it explains how to model uh, complex real life physics in a very, very simple way. Because you basically only require two classes that are not even a thousand lines long. I think they're like a hundred lines long. So, uh, and this website actually has all the examples as well, and he explains in detail how you can uh, implement a thing like this with just, in this case, four lines of code, as you can see in the bottom. And that's very great. I found something that I wanted to do, and by limiting myself, I uh, discovered a lot of new things that I learned along the way by limiting myself. And actually, uh, if you're interested in applying this uh, yourself, next week, uh, uh, sorry, next Saturday, uh, is actually the national, uh, the global day of code retreat. And there they will apply this principle of limiting yourself. What will they do there? Uh, uh, do you know Conway's uh, Game of Life? Where you constantly, I'm not going to explain it into too much detail, but it's a relatively simple problem, and they're going to solve this problem once, and then they will discuss in groups, how did I solve it? 
then it will throw away the code and then they'll try to solve it again. Each time limiting uh, yourself and each time pushing yourself to try out new things. And I think this is really great. So the first, ways that I, uh, first of ways that I showed you now is limiting yourself. And that's a good thing. The second one is automate whatever. And automation is really good because you learn a lot of things. But what you learn actually depends on what you're trying to automate. And uh, maybe some of you know this because there's one student of mine in here as well. Uh, I uh, used to teach a class for uh, half a year. And uh, even though I only had 11 students, there's one thing that I really hated, and that's taking the attendance list each day. So each day they come in and I had to mark them, oh yeah, you're present, you're present, you're present, that's fine. But that's kind of boring. I wanted to automate it, even though it takes two minutes, still, I'm a developer, automation, hooray. So I had a camera. And to do the facial recognition, I'm not some uh, great machine learning guru. So I decided I would choose an, an API that's available in Azure. By the way, if you can get free Azure resources, this is really an easy way to do this. But I have one problem, because the camera is actually a stream of frames that's coming in, and the API only takes separate frames. And often the camera would just stand there for two hours, and no student would pass by. So if I would send each frame to the cognitive service in the cloud, that would cost me a lot of money. So my solution to that was to add something very small in between. It's called OpenCV, and it's a vision library that actually uh, helped quite a lot to solve this problem. And I'll show a little bit of code. Uh, this is the full code example. So on top, you can see that I'm actually loading in a Cascade Classifier, which is a kind of detector. Uh, and it actually comes packaged with OpenCV, so you don't need to train it yourself. And this one is specifically for the frontal face. Uh, then I have a while loop, which reads the camera each frame, so it's just a loop that keeps going. And then I pass the frame into uh, the face detector, and I get back uh, an array of rectangles, and that's the faces that it actually detected. And then you can see that I use this as a small buffer, because if I don't detect any faces, then I actually do not run this, uh, do not go to cognitive services. So this was a good way to buffer this small project. And I can actually show you the example. I hope it works with a darker background here. <laughs> As you can see, it's also picking up the, the one behind me. So it's working quite well. And this is a really simple thing that I added, but it, 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 it showed me a lot. And it was actually really valuable to me to have this small thing in between. So your pet projects do not always need to be complex. You can find really simple solutions that you can put in between and you can learn different lessons. But that actually wasn't even the most important lesson I learned that day. Because I tried to apply it in my class, and uh, these, are, these are not my real students, this is a stock picture, but GDPR, you know. Um, one of my students came to me and said, Hey, it's not working for me. And I was really worried. I thought, oh, excellent. This is an awesome teaching moment. I can take this student and uh, put him next to me, and we can discover together what went wrong. Well, I used the standard facial discovery that came with OpenCV, and I've never been so embarrassed to tell my student what was wrong. This is really awful. <laughs> I, I really have no words. It was the most uh, awkward moment in my teaching career. And actually, whenever people uh, tell me, yeah, Tom, uh, do you want to do a machine learning project? This pops in my head. And this is one of the most valuable lessons that I have for myself. So also, be careful when you, out when you try to just take machine learning algorithms, because they're maybe not trained to your target audience. So those are two uh, examples that I uh, inspire myself with, just automating whatever and limiting myself. Now, the last one is a bit more complex. Does anyone know what this is? Uh, Hydron Collider. Now, we're in Antwerp, we're really bad at building big rings around the city, so uh, I couldn't build this here. But actually, what they do in the Hydron Collider is they take particles, they smash them together, layman's terms, I'm not a scientist, and uh, they do this to break them apart so they can learn more about how something works. And when you apply that to man-made things, they call it reverse engineering. Now, reverse engineering really uh, is in a gray zone. Is it legal? Is it not legal? So I wouldn't recommend that you do this, actually. But the underlying goal of reverse engineering is always so that you can replicate something. And we can always replicate something 
uh, whenever we see something cool. For example, you could build your own Spotify. Now, a lot of people say, Tom, that's not interesting. I want to build something that's uh, cool, uh, interesting, never been done before. Those three things are not pet projects, those are business ideas. And if I was selling business ideas today or talking about business ideas, there would be a guy asking money in the door. So how did I apply this principle? Um, in case you hadn't noticed my background of Aperture Science, I'm quite a nerd. So I uh, played a lot of Pokemon Go and I tried to replicate what they did. Now, I had this grand idea about uh, building a cool API, you know, all the different resources. I modeled it out in my head. I was going to use JSON to connect from uh, whatever front end I would build to uh, the back end that I would build. And then I thought, you know what? I've designed this myself now. I'm just going to try and see how much I can learn about what they actually used to implement. And then I found this uh, reverse engineering website, so I did none of the work myself, but there was a lot that I could learn by just looking at other people take apart the APK and uh, putting network uh, spoofers in between and proxying and so on. One of the uh, posts that I found was this. It's an example of a request coming into the backend. And I just said that I wanted to use JSON, but there's no JSON here. And as a developer who has seen nothing but JSON in the real life experience, this was quite a shock for me. And I, I uh, started looking around on the website a bit, and it turns out it's protocol buffers. Who of you has heard of protocol buffers? And who of you has used protocol buffers in production? A bit less, okay, cool. So uh, it turns out that while we often as developers default to using JSON, Protocol buffers seem to be a way better fit for Java uh, process communication in between. And Pokemon Go is an Android app, does Java, and a backend does also Java. So it really triggered me to think real uh, deeply on, is JSON always a good thing? And there's another thing in this picture. Do you see RPC on top? I was thinking in a, a beautiful API design with different resources and all the resources would use HTOS and they would give links back. But apparently that's not the best way to do it. There are alternatives. And sometimes we are so ingrained in what we already know that we forget to think, is this really a good thing? Because when looking deeper into this project and looking deeper into why Pokemon Go decided to go this way, they actually have a really good explanation. When you're doing microservices and you're all in the same network, it's not really an issue to use JSON. But when you're, uh, or, or different requests to many requests. But when you have a bad internet connection on your mobile phone, when you're playing the game in the middle of nowhere, just trying to catch that one Charmander that you really still need to evolve into a Charizard, then this is really crucial to optimize it. But this game, I, I can't believe I'm talking about Pokemon Go here, but this game has shown me so much more than just the technical parts because they force me now to be more conscious and cautious about the choices I make in my daily developer life. A while ago, we were starting a new project and we were going to uh, put things on a message bus and then there's processes that listen to the message bus. And my colleague, the first thing he yelled was, yeah, we'll just use JSON. And now I'm the awkward guy that starts questioning all those default things that we've been used to. So I'm more cautious and conscious about the decisions that I have to make. All of these projects that I've done, none of it is really from me. As in, I did build them, but there's, without the, the resources that I found online, I would have been able to do nothing. So one of the real life lessons is that help is everywhere. And definitely when you ask for it. Even famous speakers, when you uh, saw a presentation about Grail VM from Oleg, you can just go to him, uh, him here and just ask him more questions. Just ask. And most importantly, it, Pokemon Go and all the rest of my pet projects showed me what I love and what I really hate. You saw the bad uh, yeah, Android game I made. It didn't look good, and I know it doesn't look good because I didn't like building it. And that's a very important career lesson. 
discovering what you like and what you don't like. Because if you don't know what you, don't, what you like, then you can't orient your career towards it. And Pokemon Go actually inspired me to uh, learn about Docker, about Kubernetes, how to deploy these things. The servers were constantly breaking, so I was wondering, can I make it better by introducing fault-tolerant systems and so on? So these are the three principles. My time is almost up. Uh, I know there's plenty more, so don't limit yourself to these. Because in the end, it's all about the toolbox, how well we know our tools and how many tools we have. But for me, pet projects were a really good way to both expand my toolbox and master my toolbox. And those things are really important. And what I want to leave with you here today, oh. choose one topic, uh, spoiler alert, choose one topic this week something that you don't know and go and experience it. Even if it's just for one hour or two hours, really try to apply what you've learned because without applying, you don't really achieve much. Just like if you watch hours and hours of Bob Ross without ever touching a paintbrush won't make you a good painter, hours and hours of DevOps won't make you a better developer if you never apply what you do. So thank you.